Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. This week, I talked to longtime Seeking Alpha contributor Akram's Razor. Akram has written extensively on semiconductors, software, and global macro. Last week, Akram gave his account of how the crypto crash of 2018 impacted NVIDIA and AMD. This week, Akram and I go through NVIDIA's data center business in depth and assess the growing competitive landscape for AI accelerators from cloud and startup companies alike. What is your view on kind of where the risks and maybe rewards lie going forward from here? Look, I mean, I think for us talking about this is like, while all this was going on in the summer of 2018, all of the stuff with AI was heating up, right? So when I looked at NVIDIA's valuation, at 200 billion, you know, right around that time, August of 2018, right? I take gaming, I know how to value gaming. I take professional visualization, I know how to value professional visualization, right? I take, you know, the automotive display part, I know how to value that. I can I can slap a one to two times sales, uh, you know, even one X maybe max. But like, if you look at Intel trading at three times sales, AMD trading three times sales, and overall Nvidia trading at 15 times sales, when you decompose that, right? There's a, two ways you could look at it. You could say people were stupid, and they somehow like decided to pay a huge multiple for gaming. Or I look at it and say that was a lot of noise. It provided a bit of a of a tailwind that maybe confused some people. When I look at NVIDIA, I don't know if you read my NVIDIA data center bear thesis in, in the summer of 2018. Did you read that one? I read it recently. I didn't find your work until quite recently. That's, you know, almost offensive. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, a lot of stuff it. on Seeking Alpha. Not all of it is good. Yeah, I know. I agree. What are you talking about? It's on the platform for a while. And uh, it's very rarely these days that I find as much of the content that I used to find back in the day. But I mean, I still like, you know, they're great guys. It's this great platform. And I think it gets people into investing more so than anything else and, and into doing research and into writing. And I'm all for encouraging that. When I wrote that piece on the data center, I was basically like, look, you're paying 50 times sales for the data center revenue. That's the multiple. That's where I started focusing my work, right? Because I was already familiar with what's going on. The TPU is out there. The, the, the ruckus started in that. And that to me was like, you're not going to go after a $200 billion company and think it's going to you know, lose $120 billion in market cap. I mean, NVIDIA last year lost more in market value than any semiconductor company since Intel crashed in 2000, right? Like there's, it's literally number two after just the Intel bubble pop. It's a huge loss. They lost like, they essentially lost the Broadcom. So when you consider the size of that, Where's the margin? Where's the long-term story? What were people excited about? What were you excited about, right? AI, right? Sure. And AI was one where you're just like, what's going on? Like, this is where I need to invest my time, right? You had all these startups, the money starting to flow into the startup space. And like crypto was, let's call it like from an options positioning catalyst driver for a potential, you know, grand slam event type trade. But from a secular thesis, my interest was on data center. It's like the shift in hyperscale, what's going on, like who are you competing with? What are your margins? What's this market going to look like? How big can it possibly be? You know, and it's not even a question of how big can it be. It's like what are the ASPs and demand mix at scale? That's a big thing in chips, right? How did you do your research when you were trying to answer these questions and what was your initial conclusion? Well, I mean, I think I started out with getting very familiar with what was going on with the TPU, right? I had to do some catch-up work, having been like not paying as much attention to that space since I left Mobileye, right? And when I got into that, I started understanding it, and I started understanding what Intel had deployed internally, right? 
So Google, it's like Intel, uh, uh, sorry, Google deployed yeah. internally. It's like if Google is using this hard, like if you go on Seeking Alpha, there's these, uh, these, there's some very knowledgeable bulls on NVIDIA, right? And they will hammer you on the comment section with all this stuff. Like Google Cloud has NVIDIA GPUs. I'm like, great. But have you ever talked to someone at Google and been like, okay, so you're using these internally? No, we're using TPU1 still. We're still deploying to this day TPU1. Search, a bunch of stuff internally. So TPU did you manage one, to talk to right? some of those folks? Yeah, I mean, I've talked to people at Google. Google people are very diplomatic, okay? I would say, like, of everybody involved, Google has never taken a very competitive, talked any trash, uh, remotely anything regarding NVIDIA, right? So, like, Jensen will get on a call, and he'll be like, look, and he, he was asked about the TPU on one call, only one call so far. And his response was, look, I mean, uh, TPU, A6, A uh, blah, 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 kind of... Uh, like, look, the GPU can do HPC, the GPU can do graphics, the GPU can do machine learning and deep learning, right? It's super flexible, right? These A6 are, are limited, but even then on a chip to chip compare, we're faster, right? And it's like, all right, but when Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Facebook go shopping and, and considering if you've seen what they do internally with their hardware, right? Total cost of ownership is a big deal. And what have you, what, like, what were you selling the V100 for when it came out? $17,000? Right. So something along those lines, uh, you know, at, at peak pricing and on initial launch. So like these guys clearly made decisions very early on that we're not going to be dependent on this. Right. And like you can never get them to tell you the economics. You can't get people at Broadcom who supposedly is like won't even acknowledge whether the, the manufacturer of the TPU, but you can guess and like the, that appears to be the case. But like the economic advantage that they're getting out of using their own hardware has got to be ridiculous. How ridiculous? Well, look at today. What's the T4 cost you? A quarter of the cost of the V100, right? Couple and thousand, the V100s right? come down in price anyway, a decent amount over the last two years. And if it's a quarter of the cost of the V100, and I'm trading ResNet you know, version 1.5 on TensorFlow on it, right? I'm getting images per second per dollar, a 40% boost, right? Now, here's the, the TPU is flexible, and I can do int4, and I can do inferencing, right? So like this is before this even came out. You got to rewind and like if, if they can sell that at that price, like what's Google's cost? You know, forget the non-recurring engineering cost, which is something that they could do. But what is Google's real raw cost for that TPU? I mean, it's got to be way down there to the point where you look at NVIDIA and you're like, if anybody else in hyperscale cracks this, like what type of market are we dealing with? which is also part of the problem for the startups. I tried to answer the same question. And, and the way I went about it was I went and looked at Google's pricing for TPU when, when they finally made it generally available through their public cloud service for their API calls, like uh, you know image recognition and, and classification, tagging, that kind of stuff. It was They priced it at the same rate as uh, the available, I think it was like maybe K80s or, or P100s at the time. I was very surprised they did not price it lower if they had a cost advantage. So think about it this way. Google is not looking at GCP initially as a pure, like an AI demand driver. You're saying right? internal use. Yes. So my focus is like, and we're talking about TPU what, 2, version 2, right? For GCP. Version 1 is, is the big one for it. Like it's internal inferencing, yes. right? And that's the one where they've written the paper and talked about, you know, how many you know, more data centers they'd have to build if they didn't do this, if just this many people used uh, Google Voice and whatnot. So Google, where they're pricing externally, where they basically been the only alternative in the market for a cloud, it just has to be slightly competitive. I don't think you're looking at it from that standpoint. Why, where why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they offer it, say, half the price and then steal a bunch of market share from AWS? I mean, the point of building these TPUs, surely, yes, the first reason they gave was to supply the kind of growth in kind okay, of it's voice. it's price competitive. I mean, I don't know what you're talking Like in terms of that, so, do you remember when eBay moved in June or July? Sure, but they moved from an internal cluster, right? GCP's mandate, the reason to be is to kind of win back the cloud computing crown from AWS. We know a huge amount of the cloud computing capacity is going towards AI. So why wouldn't, if they had the secret weapon, they had a multi-factor cost advantage with the TPU, why wouldn't they offer instances of the TPU that offer, you know, ResNets and LSTM training performance or inference so, performance so at a fraction of AWS? This question. Mm -hmm. Where does Google have the biggest advantage over everybody in anything these days? It's artificial intelligence. Do they want to make the hardware advantage they've established 
immediately so cheap for everybody else working to compete? I mean, they're trying to win share from, from AWS, no, no, no. right? You're thinking about this as I want to sell a commodity cloud business. But what if my secret sauce is developing the higher stack of applications where I want to automate so many different things and I want to give you the stack, like I give you a Google Maps API, right? And you build on top of it. So I don't necessarily think you can look at it and say like it was even in, in a strategic advantage to Google beyond being cheaper than hosting internally, but not so absurdly cheap to essentially change certain dynamics where they have a huge competitive advantage. Like, if, wouldn't that be the avenue? You, you, you win them over with this AI workload and then you can sell them everything else that you can offer through GCP. Bro, Google could give away, all right? They could give away the training. We're talking about a trillion dollar company with a cash flow ridiculousness. So we can't even look at that price and take it seriously. If it was strategically something that they felt they needed to do, you could make the training completely free. <laughs> it's not a problem. They have right? done other things, though, that suggest they're trying to just buy, like, for example, like some of the terms I think they gave to um, some of these startups like Snap to have them move to GCP. Some of those are from some of the stories. They seem to be like break even or maybe even a loss leader deals. Okay. So, I mean, again, if they can do that there, why can't they do that with their TPU training chips? Well, I think they should. Why don't they? Well, I mean, we just posited one potential consideration, an advantage that they don't want everybody else to have yet. When someone else comes out with hardware that is in that level, fine, maybe. But it doesn't seem like they're taking that view because they could give it away for free. Why wouldn't they want just a software company to have that? That's no threat to them, right? I mean, I agree with you. It's, it's one where I've had debates with people in the past and I'm like, I don't understand why, like, if they really, like... If you're sitting here with a TPU and the people who are using it for this and they're getting this advantage, like why not just make it free? <laughs> like if you're if you're beating Amazon to the punch. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's well, it. I mean, they can. You don't have to be a financial genius to figure it out. And looking at Google's bottom line, the type of projects that they're willing to do and invest in, they could make it free. So that's when you rewind and you're like, there's a strategic reason they don't want to make it free, let alone even price it super competitively, right? And that maybe has a lot more to do with the way they look at the broader AI spectrum and their position in it and the edge that maybe they've established internally with their hardware that they don't necessarily want to open up to everybody else yet. Okay. Right? That's the only way you can rationalize it because that has to be more valuable than winning GCP business. But they offered on GCP anyway. So they have this high- This is my point. They, they have to, GCP is a supermarket, right? It's got to offer everything. So when people like people get excited, you know, when they when Google announced they were adding the T4 to GCP, it was like September 16 or something of last year. The stock was like just off its all time high. It was like 285, about to tick 290 or whatever. And everybody got really excited. It rallied on that. It was like, see, Google needs need, needs NVIDIA. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I it's was like, one of those people. Are they using it internally? No, they're still deploying freaking uh, TPUs internally. Well, so the, sure, but okay. So I think this this is a question really broadly about kind of these these AI chips and and what kind of market is available or how flexible they are and what what good they are, what kind of workloads they are. But you raise a very good question, and and these are the types of things you know when you look at analysts covering the space, these are the types of questions that should be asked. Like I mean, like these are major strategic decisions and i don't think they want to discuss them right yeah here's what's not so clear to me about we have when we look at the external kind of how google is treating the tc the tpu it seems kind of mixed messages because it's so mixed you can interpret it in one of many ways one i guess charitable interpretation for nvidia at least is that these tpus are not very uh, flexible and do not address all the kind of workloads that external customers demand right so internally they're deploying tpus sure because they built the tpu for their own internal workload they had all the kind of you know, six different kind of workloads, MLPs and CNNs and so forth. They knew what they were good for and, and they have lots of those scale for those kind of workloads. So they can just deploy those very predictably. But if you deploy in GCP, your customers could be, you know, anyone from, from Square to Atlassian to Target. You don't know what models they're running. You don't know what frameworks they're running. And TPUs right now only support TensorFlow. I think they've announced intent to, to maybe support PyTorch. But right now it's basically TensorFlow. So if your customers don't use those particular frameworks or or they have very weird models that don't map well to your hardware. I think it, that may be one possible reason why it doesn't show that well on, on the GCP side. So you, you actually raise a very interesting point going there, because if you look at the developer side of the story, right, and I'm a customer and I'm working on a model, I'm a data scientist. I mean, NVIDIA is in a great position because 
I can use the gaming cards. I can go to Lambda Labs, have them build me like, you know, a 2060 workstation, which performance for dollars is 10x the V100. So we're only talking here when when we're getting into this on large scale training, right? And it's at that point where I think, you know, that's the market like NVIDIA is, Google is looking at it both internally and both maybe potential for customers. Like we're talking mass systems, right? Where the competitive advantage that they can bring to bear both in cooling, networking, and the chips that they've designed and their internal ability to customize. And that's where you get into, you run into this issue with, with the data center customers because it's at that level where it's like, all right, CUDA is not as important, right? I can deal with this. Even AMD can be used internally, you know, at hyperscale and, and they're getting some adoption because they can handle it with the human capital talent that they've invested in. So when you make that point in terms of the lack of flexibility for the TPU, if you don't have those internal resources for an external customer, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. I mean, you do have multi-AI stacks, right? And, you know, whether it's MXNet or PyTorch or, or TensorFlow or whatnot, TensorFlow is definitely the leader. And I don't think it, Google has to prioritize anything beyond that with where they're at positioning wise. But maybe that factors into part of their pricing too. Okay, so you you kind of viewed this. You saw that basically TPU competition was coming. How did you position, and and what did you think was going to happen to Nvidia's data center business? So look, this is where you, I looked at. It wasn't just TPU. I don't view TPU. I look at that market, and I'm like, if I'm looking at people going to cloud as a secular theme in computing, you obviously have to be very wary dealing with these customers. This is another thing where you look at Intel. When Intel's most recent data center. Uh, quarter when the when the stock got hit hard and whatever it was May or April end of April you saw that the enterprise side of the business was where they got hit hard it was down like 28 30 percent not necessarily so much more so on on cloud volume but the thing is Google Intel does better obviously on the non cloud customers on pricing right and this is where you get into this game where you, you look at that market and you say look if these guys are going to get to 50% 60% you know 65% market share for and you're a big chip company and, and you're basically counting on them to drive a huge volume in many ways like you know an apple works with a supplier right and you look at that and you're like all right What's that going to do to ASPs? Well, we've seen in the Google case, they went internal. They built something for themselves, right? And they started when? They started like back in at end of 14, 15, like late 14. So like this, this is a decision planned well in advance. They're, they're a first mover there. And you're like, all right, I mean, Amazon is a champion here. They're going to do this. And there was tons of debates around this topic. And honestly, Amazon didn't announce, announce Inferentia on the inference side till after NVIDIA stock had lost its first 30%. But I had so many people who were saying, and Amazon hardware publicly was like, look, we're very happy with the uh, uh, GPUs. We can't see a reason why we're going into this. Maybe on, on devices when they bought Annapurna Labs uh, on the cameras and you know edge inferencing, okay, it's one thing. But outside of the edge, okay, no big deal. Data center, we can't see ourselves going this route. And what, two months later, they announced their, their data center inferencing solution, right? So put those two together and then look at everybody in investing in VC land was looking at the space and basically making a decision at that point in time that, well, okay, this is a highly profitable business with a long secular story. Let's start raining money on it. And you started seeing startup after startup after startup raising money, raising money to build a better mousetrap, you know, for machine learning, deep learning training. And I started getting into that market, talking to VCs, talking to some of these startups, trying to understand the technical things that they're bringing to bear. And like, you know, I mean, I, I've seen you sit on those panels and debate that stuff. And look, where, where we're at today, no one's really cracked that nut yet. I mean, I think the one who's really made some progress in terms of highlighting performance and like something that like can visibly be seen and used is Habana. Graphcore supposedly now is, is getting close and, and clients are testing their, their chips. But like, you know, he, he had given some guidance to the market at the end of last year. I think he did in a Bloomberg interview. And it seems like, you know, the, the NVIDIA competitive base has been a bit behind schedule. But I look at that market. And even when I would talk to a venture capitalist, and I would listen to them, they'd explain it. You're talking guys who used to work at ARM, other places. Is This is very different from, from software, right? So like they, they walk you through it and what's going on. And by the time they're done, I'm like, you know, this is an NVIDIA short thesis. <laughs> 
You know, like, why are you putting your money in shorting NVIDIA? It's $200 billion in it's liquid. Because if you do this and another startup does this and all the hyperscalers do this and all of a sudden 200 companies and more capital has gone into Silicon startups than we ha- we've seen in 20 years for the first time, that usually doesn't end well, right? This isn't about I take the capital and I go buy a customer, right? And I spend on search advertising, right? To go target developers for my new API or whatever. I build a better mousetrap. I don't need to market it. But but I'm, we're all chasing the same customer base. Merchant Silicon needs to get into that data center because it's so concentrated. So like if I'm Google and Amazon sitting and I'm the head of hardware decision making and I've got our internal projects, I've got AMD trying to get some, some share and I've got you know 200 startups out there get, showing up on my door every other day. Hey, play with our chip. Hey, play with our chip. I can draw one conclusion. What's that conclusion? ASPs are going to be going down. A lot. And right now, NVIDIA's data center business runs 80% gross margin, the company's highest of all its, of any of its uh, platforms. Correct. And that's the golden jewel that when I'm a venture capitalist, I look at that and I see Jensen standing up holding something in his finger that costs as much as a car that's still silicon, right? And I say, oh, I need to get into this space. But if I do that and 200 other people do that, by the time we have something ready to go to market and production volumes... What is going to be that average selling price, right? And this is where I think it's interesting. If you were to look at NVIDIA today in data center, I read your presentation, right? And you, you highlighted that uh, the drop off in data center the last two quarters and NVIDIA not immune to hyperscale, right? Question mark. And my question is, is has NVIDIA just been, can- the V100 been cannibalized by uh, the T4? Like if I can get a 40% performance per dollar minimum improvement over on the T over the V100 on training, right? Why would I ever buy a V100 for machine learning, deep learning data center? We understand the problem that used to exist with the gaming cards. NVIDIA literally changed, you know, the service agreement. And like, if you're downloading CUDA into a data, you can't, you can't do it. It's illegal, right? Because it's a 10 X performance per dollar difference between today, let's say a 2060 and a V100. And you know now they've made it, you can't NV link them, you can't do so many things. Like They're trying to make that more difficult. But you come out with your inferencing card, which they want to position to the inferencing market where a lot of people see the volume. And your inferencing card is a quarter of the cost, but it's still a GPU and a GPU can train. Cannibalization is an interesting thesis. Uh, I spoke to a, another kind of semiconductor, anonymous semiconductor analyst yesterday, Dylan, he runs on Twitter. His theory is that the training is starting to get saturated, at least at the current level of capacity. And one thing NVIDIA did highlight in their last quarter is that they saw a strong inflection in inference sales. I think they've previously said it's double digit percentage of that of, of data center revenues already, but they highlighted that as a as a key growth area, I think with T4 as well. But interesting, that can be interpreted, what you're saying is that they can have inflection in that, but they can also have simultaneous declines in training. Bro, look at everybody who advertises on the T4. Like they basically point out, by the way, it's a cheaper alternative for training. They don't get too, too detailed into it. If you go to NVIDIA and just Google T4, V100, ResNet, they literally have pulled up all the benchmarks and suck on, their, on their site because they want to show off the inferencing, right? And they show you training and inferencing. They just give you one. I think it's, it's version, ResNet 1.5 in terms of time to completion and images per second. They give it all for the T4 on inferencing versus the V100. They don't give you anything, even though they show one after the other for the training side. You, why do they not do that? Because you sit there and you run the basic math. And you're like, all right, at worst case scenario, it's 40%. So if it's 40% worst case scenario, performance per dollar, a throughput per dollar, and that's not factoring in power consumption. So at 70 watts versus close to 300 or whatever on, on the V100 at 10 cent per kilowatt hour, if I'm running these things around the clock, I'm also saving about 200 plus dollars a year on the T4 in a data center. So it's a huge price difference advantage. And going back to Jensen's great statement, the GPU is flexible, right? This is even more flexible because the V100 doesn't do int4. So if I want integer 4 math and I want even lower precision for inferencing, which people want, I get that in the T4. And if I want to train something, I can network it and I can put 20 of these in a server. I've got the networking functionality and everything. And AI demand for training has to double for me to generate the same revenue just without factoring in the cost of power. That's an intriguing thesis. So when I look at it and I look at the demand that Intel saw in DCG and them saying that, I'm like, NVIDIA, give me platform ASP. 
already. Come on. <laughs> Just disclose it. And if anyone is long the stock, right, and talking to the 32 people who cover it, like the Goldman Sachs analysts can't tell the difference between Turing and the data center and Turing and gaming, and he's putting out reports uh, recommending a buy on NVIDIA, he can't call his, uh, you know, his, his Google analyst and be like, hey, let me talk to the head of AI hardware at Google, Amazon, and let's come out with a serious report of what's going on here. No, they, they don't have time to do that, right? Well, you would think their clients would be like, look, Intel's disclosing platform and volume ASPs and data center. Like, we'd like to know what they are. Start asking NVIDIA because th this is like, it's, it, it's a secret that doesn't need to be a secret. I've never seen Google look so small in my life. He took the Turing performance over Pascal in gaming. He built a data center chart and he stuck Google in, like literally it looked like Mighty Mouse. NVIDIA under Turing as Superman, a thousand times performance. Like literally everybody who's invested in an AI chip startup, fold up, fold up operations, Okay. Because here comes Turing. It's going to deliver a thousand times performance in AI. It's, 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 I mean, like that, but like that tells you what was going on in the market. Forget what like they were missing in crypto. That's the level of things in AI. And I do feel bad for them. that They're, they're starved on their research end. And, you know, it's a tough job covering, you know, 10, 15 companies and analyst calls and meetings and this and that. But you're Goldman Sachs. You have resources. You're paid a lot of money. So your overall take is, look, you don't have to figure out whether GraphCore's architecture really works. You don't have to know if Habana is going to steal all the revenue. But some of these folks will succeed to some extent. The, the internal efforts of these hyperscale companies developing AI chips will supply them with an alternative. It may not be as good in every situation, but it will be able to fill in a lot of roles. And the net effect of these is without calling anything specifically, NVIDIA's current prices for their data center boards will have to come down. Well, I mean, they have come down. That's number one. I mean, NVIDIA puts this stuff on their website. So we know the difference between the T4 and the V100. They've priced something that's more competitive for inferencing because no one's spending that mo money on the V100 okay, for inferencing. And they've priced something that's more competitive on inferencing, which is actually a 40% performance per dollar improvement, okay, at minimum. And that's without factoring in power consumption over your today's price of the V100, which let's say like when I run this, I'm talking about like $10,000 versus $2,500 or so in that neighborhood, now, right? Now that's not, not a surprise, like, right? When, not, when, not, not initially when, when things came out. When you look at hardware in general, whether it's whether it's just regular old gaming graphics cards or Ferraris or, or whatnot, the, the last... The highest end model will always be disproportionately more expensive per, per dollar than the you know second or third most expensive. That's not exactly an anomaly. Yeah. Did you look at the comparison I did on AlexNet? And if you were using those GPUs today, I'm just talking about you haven't. What did throughput go up? And what did price go up? You're literally better off putting like like at the pricing that was going on before. This is the thing. Nvidia was over earning. This happens in chips all the time because if they had something. That was such a secret, crazy sauce, right? Jensen would have taken it private. He would have figured it out, right? But like, that's the problem. Google was able to get this work done on the TPU. I mean, it's a matrix multiply unit. I mean, yeah, it's not super flexible, but if I need a hammer for something that I want to train super fast and it's a nail and Jensen comes over and he's like, by the way, you know, we can do HPC. We can do, you know, 64-bit math, uh, seismic analysis. And, and it's like, listen, I'm not doing any of that here, right? Don't sell me Home Depot. I just want the hammer. <laughs> so you're saying V100 is over, uh, was kind of overpriced. I guess it's not. Uh, no, uh, you can't say it's overpriced. If people have no choice but to pay for it, you're doing great, right? But my point is they were over-earning. One thing I know for They're certain not in terms of they were capital over investment into startups and ships, okay, is that if you've seen this before, it changes the economics of the industry to the point where like, if you have like 100 different companies and chip engineers are getting paid bank to figure something out and they're all working on it, and just a few of them get to that point where their production, they still, to justify their business model, who do they need as customers, James? Or hyperscale enterprise. Exactly, yeah. right? And hyperscale, how many options do they currently have already? I mean, like they can do a little bit with, with uh, Xilinx. Intel's doing what they're trying to do. They have CPU options and, and, and whatnot. They're doing their business with NVIDIA. They have their own internal projects. Along comes Merchant New Silicon, completely focused on ASEX in this space. And they can't be viable without the volumes you provide, right? So what is that price point of the person who cracks that nut? And what type of performance advantage does he have to develop 
to be a game changer where like they can just name their price. It's going to be cutthroat. Like I look at NVIDIA today and I'm like, maybe they should just move away from this whole thing that we just sell GPUs. Like why can't you, like why can't it be more clearly segmented? Because like they still want that element of th that GPU is that switchblade. It's that fancy Swiss army knife because they've invested so heavily in CUDA. But what, what like, do you wanna, if I what just do you want, want them to switch multiplication to? for certain things, like, and that's where a lot of volume is going to be, maybe NVIDIA's business ends up looking different. Maybe we have to look at NVIDIA today and say that they've got like a developer ecosystem where I build a workstation and, and people are familiar with the software and it's flexible and a couple data scientists and, and that's like the professional visualization market. But the data center training and inferencing, and if we think automotive chips to handle the same thing like look at like what tesla did i mean we went through this with tesla when you're saying they should seed gradually the hyperscale market no no no. i'm saying that it's a different market when you look at the hyperscale market in of itself and the type of demand that they're going to have let's say from the professional visualization data scientist type person buying an rtx or a, like you know older pascal car back in the day to do ai research Versus someone wants to buy like 10,000 chips to, to drive super throughput at, at the hyperscale level. That is more suited to an ASEC because they can do things internally, right? A custom chip. It's, it's like you have to look at that market and say, we got different markets here and they were over earning in that market. So what are you saying they should do? Well, I'm saying if you're in their position, like they could have been more aggressive on pricing and taking share earlier to make it less appealing for people to invest in the space and not put themselves in the type of volatile scenario that they just run, run okay. themselves into. So, so you thought they overpriced their products, basically. It's not that they overpriced the products. Remember, they caught a boom. Then they could have been much more aggressive on the way down. Instead, they shifted to let's milk it. And they were willing to do that in gaming. I'm not seeing the so difference it's, it's, here. You're still saying they should have reduced prices at some point. I'm saying they could have been. They could have taken a share. Think about oil and the way people always talk about OPEC and whatnot. There's this argument is cut pricing make it unattractive to invest in my space, yes, right? Yes. And put everyone out of business and then I reap the benefits later, okay? But if everybody's looking at my space and I'm just raising pricing, I've got pricing at the max and I'm holding you hostage, I'm going to go find another solution. You ain't holding gold. Jensen is not holding Google hostage and they proved that. I see your point, but I still don't know why you don't agree when I said that you're saying they, they should have basically priced lower to protect themselves. I'm saying they should have cut pricing once demand was where it's at, at to keep their customers happy, right? Okay. So but instead with of the targeting- view that, It's like freemium model and software. Here's the crack. I will charge for you for it down the road when you have no other option. Okay. Right? So, so let me just make this clear. You're saying, I'm not, still not sure you agree with this, but if they, instead of targeting 80% gross margins for data center, if they targeted, say, 40%, maybe not that low, 50 to 60%, that would dramatically decrease the incentive to create 40 startups out of the VC community. Yeah. I mean, it's not 40. It's got to be in the 150 range. I mean, 40 can, respectable ones that yeah, I can, yeah, I, I can count. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. hundred uh, like percent. And look, dude, what's the biggest other thing we, we, the, the elephant in the room we're not talking about here, who is coming into this game late and everything else, yeah. but on this game on time, the Chinese. Oh, Chinese. <laughs> okay. God forbid you, you look at anything where the Chinese attack a market like they did with Bitmain and like the very similar elements here when you're looking at matrix multiplication and, and building something custom and attacking a market like machine learning, deep learning, and the Chinese are view this strategically and they view it as, you know what, we're on more equal footing than we are with, let's say, the CPU or the memory market and, and whatnot, right? I, I guess so, one thing we like, haven't really talked about is how much – we're talking about this like it's a com complete commodity, uh, just, a, just a chip filled with uh, matrix multiply units. But I, I think the – Jensen would say, and I think what a lot of developers have d definitely vetted out, is that there's a huge amount of software content on top of this. If it were just a matter of a commodity chip, yes, I think China, Taiwan, no, that, that's South where I Korea. disagree with you because here's the, here's the thing. I agree 100% a huge software content developer level. I'm talking about large scale super systems for training where I have the resources and I'm already paying millions of dollars a year internally for the AI talent, all right, to make it work and make the hardware a commodity. That's where that advantage that is that developer ecosystem goes in the other direction.
if you're Google, even then, like you have you have scale. If you buy a training chip from, let's say next year you buy it from Graphcore, and you're trying to train, you, you, you train ResNet, sure, that works great. But if you have a new model, Google Research is pumping out models every day, right? If you come up with a new fancy transformer model, you come up with a new GAN or something like that. All things being equal, I assume that will just run much worse on the younger startup AI chip than NVIDIA's. No, uh, no, that's incorrect. I mean, look, uh, first thing, where a graph core is focusing, and if you've got graph core CEO, like he would tell you convolutional neural nets are simple. All right, feed forward. They work well with a GPU. GPUs be able to be competitive there. Once you get out of there, the memory constraint issues, okay, and, and machine learning, deep learning, that's where GraphCore is focused. His, like, the, they're not trying to crack the CNN problem. Sure, sure. So he would vehemently disagree with you because the general view is that the CNN side of things is where essentially, you know, the GPU has actually been able to, you know, make that pivot and, and fill that hole really nicely. It's when you get when you get into LSTM and these other areas, it's, it's a completely different ballgame. Yeah, and the graph course slides where they claim the greatest performance growth, uh, kind of delta versus GPUs are LSTMs and, and things like that. But I mean, that's just two different kinds of networks. I mean, conceivably out of Google research, they could be using any number of models. It could be using transformers, completely new kind of models. And generally, GPU performance is a little bit more, I think, more predictable because NVIDIA gets hold of those models immediately and starts optimizing it for the software and start rolling it out immediately. I think in those scenarios, you, if you're developing new models, GPUs should generate more predictable and higher reliable performance than if you were to get a kind of fancy chip from a startup okay so we don't really know if a fancy chip from a startup can solve some serious constraint problems which is what they're working on right then you optimize the software infrastructure for it and obviously that's what they're, they're looking to do if you have a hardware leap you're actually basically framing this problem within the context of them not making a hardware leap by trying to to essentially design around the constraints of the GPU, which is why everyone's invested to solve this problem. But of course, the GPU is super flexible. And that's where you get into the point where like, hey, AMD's here as a second source now, and we're willing to work with them to try to play catch up internally on the data center. And this is where you see Xilinx is investing in what they're investing in. But the bottom line is NVIDIA is still well positioned, right? I look at it and I say, the best thing they have going for them is on the developer data science side, like you got to make a huge leap, okay, in performance per dollar, right, to compete with them. Because essentially, what is it? If you wanted to say, I'm going to do 10x Volta, well, the 2060 on a lot of stuff is going to be able to deliver me, you know, that 10 times Volta performance per dollar performance. So I got to get up to 100x, where in theory, investments were made with ROI assumptions on the type of business I can have based on how lucrative NVIDIA's business was now and let's say 18 months ago. Because like we said, like like today, who's NVIDIA's biggest competitor in data center? It's NVIDIA. It's the new T4 as far as I'm concerned. It's like demand has to go up significantly higher because you've already seen an ASP decline. Now, I think Part of that is they have to be more competitive. They're still making a GPU and a GPU still needs tensor cores, right? So the T4 has half the tensor cores of the V100. You, you can kill it on the HPC. It's nowhere as good in HPC because you've made a choice, but you can't also make an inferencing card that's a GPU that isn't going to be pretty damn good at training if you're using similar architectures. And that's where it's like, all right, well, if I want, if I need to price inferencing competitively, which is why like you had people, you know, like Baidu on, on the lowdown was buying tons of, you know, Pascal cards, right? And like NVIDIA wasn't happy about that. Maybe NVIDIA's next Turing, well, next inference chip will kind of segment out the, the training workload a little bit more. Yeah, okay. But carefully. I mean, like, is that going to make your customers happy? <laughs> mm, no, I mean, it wouldn't be. <laughs> then I'm going to stick on the T4 and then you're going to drive up the T4 demand. It's actually fascinating. Nobody's really looked at it because if you go to their website, they've run the compares. Yeah. They want to highlight the ones on the inferencing. But if you go to like Amazon or, or, or Google Cloud and, and you, you read through a lot of these things and you get on these hacker news and Reddit threads and so, at times, and like it's advertised as, hey, this is a good value for your money on training. They don't come out and say, by the way, don't ever buy a V100. But it's a thing. And this is, I mean, like, remember, these are segmented markets too, right? I mean, have you been following what's going on in HPC? Did you follow uh, AMD winning uh, Oak Ridge uh, Frontier? Sure. Okay. So you read the next platform, right? Yeah, it's a great site. Okay, so in the next platform, uh, on the announcement of Cray and AMD winning that contract, there's an interview with the head of the Oak Ridge Laboratory, the director, and like he's willing to be quoted, being like, "Hey, 
when NVIDIA was the only game in town, they could do whatever they want on pricing. But that's no longer the case. That's public, right? Pretty aggressive. On the record in the next platform. And why? Because the Frontier system at a cost per teraflop is like 380 bucks. And when they did Summit, it was like $1,100. That's like a 65% decline. So you can go ask NVIDIA again, did you not compete on this? Were you not willing to match on price? Like, what are you doing? And then it becomes no surprise that they went out and bought Mellanox because they are under attack from all sides. With supercomputers, also that, that kind of unnatural vendor balancing that happens in the background. But, but I agree the prices have come down quite a lot. And AMD- I mean, I'd say, I'd say 70% per, per petaflop is, is not like quite a lot. It's a financial model changing, rework it all type of drop. Yeah. And AMD has stepped up their game. So I don't know they were around for the, for the summit race, even if they wanted to compete. Okay. Well, listen, Akram, we've covered a lot of ground. We've gone way, way, way long, which I think a few of our listeners will love and maybe others would have dropped off by now. But I think it's great we got to this level of detail. Oh, no, no problem. You've written extensively about semiconductors. You've also covered software in a great depth. And we, I hope to get to talk to you about that another time. But for people who are interested in, in reading about your work, where can they find you? Uh, Seeking Alpha. You know, Akram's Razor on Seeking Alpha. I mean, it's... It's not complicated. You get up. I have a subscription service. I'm not necessarily. I've never really advertised for it or anything. It's just like who finds their way into it. But you know, hasn't necessarily been a focus. But yeah, if you you know, my stuff is out there on Seeking Alpha for free, <laughs> so you can read it. Okay, I see you have some activity on Twitter, but you should definitely push more uh, of your content on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, well, I mean, Nvidia was like six months of my life. If you're gonna do hardcore research, it's it's, it's very hard to also do that and sit on Twitter and and interviews and self-promote and so on and so forth and trade on your own and manage positions. And if you're managing money doing that, it's like you can't do it all, right? So if you're going to do the research, I think the research is the most valuable part. And that's where I, I mean, I really enjoy it. I mean, I, I see the stuff you write and you seem to find a nice balance between what you write, what you publish and Twitter activity. I mean, for me, it's, it's so far, I haven't really cracked that nut. Yeah, Twitter. I would I would definitely recommend because it it helps with the research. That's that's why it's not a pure uh, loss of your time. People will come to you and tell you things, and you'll have great conversations, and and, and it will change your opinion. But I think one thing that I would say, you know, from coming from this conversation and like going back to last summer, you know, people always view this like an Nvidia as a long and a short. Oh, this is a short seller. He wants to knock the stock down, or you know, Jensen's created a great company. We can, you know, I I can sit here and give it like a hard time. And we refer to him, you know, like on a first name basis, like it's like a multi-billionaire super success story or whatever, like who am I? But the point is, is that he's CEO of a company and he's really put himself out there as a founder CEO, right? He's really active in it. And I think the transparency, he's not shy. He gets in the media, you know, he's willing to talk. And I think, you know, from your standpoint, even as a former employee, I don't really know your views on it, but if I'm an investor in a stock, it shouldn't just be like, all right, I have blind faith in, in this profit of a CEO, founder. Like I should, like if there's material information that can make it easier for me to make my decision to evaluate them, like why aren't I getting it? I think that's you know? a good question. It's a good question for not just NVIDIA, for a lot of companies. Increasingly, we've seen them dial back information you know, across the industry. I agree. I mean, the Apple example is, 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 is on point there, but this is one where like the most notable other company in the space, Intel, gives the same stuff on data center. And you're not even talking about it. You've changed my mind on this. So when I get off this, I'll uh, have a chat with those folks and certainly express those views. Yeah, tell them. They start disclosing ASPs. <laughs> All right, Akram. It's been great talking I mean, to you today. I mean, if they prove me wrong, I will go buy the stock today. I mean, it's like I'm happy to change my view if I sit there and I think, okay, like this dispels some element of concerns that I've had. I want to see that. And like it's, it's something that's so material that – you know, I think any person who, whether it's a pension fund manager or a sell side analyst, like if you're missing something this material and it's something that like you're so focused on on something else and we've just kind of forgotten about it and we're buying into just some broad narrative about the future, like there's no reason that, to keep it secret because if you look at the way this space works, I mean, there's two GPU companies. People move from one to the other. You don't think they know internally what's going on. You don't think Intel has a clue. And you don't think all their big hyperscale customers have a clue. So a situation where put it out there. 
the only people who are suffering are the ones who are looking at it and being like, all right, hey, we had this like in their most recent quarter, they come out and they say, inferencing was really good for us. Well, is that because you've branded the T4 as an inferencing card? Because it can also trade and everyone you're selling it to is advertising that it's a cheaper training alternative. So what should we be worried about cannibalization? Like are, if you sold a bunch more units of these, did the much higher ASP of this go down and you didn't anticipate this? Or are you segmenting, you're not segmenting your market properly? Like how do we model you going forward? That's a fair point. All right, Akram, it's been great talking to you. We hope to talk to you, catch you again next time. All right, thank you. That's it for this week. You can find the full ARC team on Twitter. We'll catch you next week. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.